So, John, thank you so much for taking the time. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, you're the UK government COP26 envoy. First and foremost, you know, thank you and congratulations for the outcome of the negotiations last year. It was a historical moment, dipping under two degrees uh, in terms of the commitments. Uh, it feels like a lot has happened since the negotiations back in Glasgow last year, um, and a lot that is very consequential for uh, climate negotiations. Um, interestingly, I think that we've moved the conversation from an energy transition discussion to an energy crisis question. There's some tensions there between the short term, the long term. Can you maybe tell us your perspective on transition versus crisis? So um, there's a lot to unpack and obviously a lot has happened since, since COP26 and few of us anticipated the, the war of aggression in, in Ukraine. Um, clearly, Russia's actions mean that uh, uh, energy supply has, has been an issue over the last few months. But one could argue that the, the, the element of crisis in terms of pricing that we're experiencing is because we have not made the transition to renewable energy fast enough. And so when governments like my own conducted an energy security review in the earlier part of this year after the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, we concluded that actually that the best way we could preserve our energy security and indeed therefore bring prices down, be less dependent on imported hydrocarbons, was to move ahead even more swiftly with the transition to a low carbon economy. And that's why you saw, for example, the, the UK raising its target for offshore wind from 40 gigawatts by 2030 to 50 gigawatts, um, which is a, you know, a huge uh, increase. We've also seen the German government and others take similar steps. So actually, one of the consequences of, of the war in Ukraine is yes, there has been a temporary reversion in a few cases to, to burning more fossil fuels in order to keep the lights on. But if you map the area under the emissions graph by 2030 in an economy like Germany, mm -hmm. as a result of the decisions that they've made, actually the area under the graph will be smaller because they're accelerating their transition to renewables and away from hydrocarbons. Yep. And I mean, I think this a lot of this has to do with cost curves, right? We're, I mean, we're now actually in a moment where solar is the cheapest source of energy. Um, they are, in effect, economically outcompeting fossil fuels. Um, it might actually be a short-term disruption. It might look like we're taking a few steps back, but it could be to actually accelerate even faster. I do think that the energy transition will take place more swiftly than people imagine. Mm. And if you just go back to other technologies uh, that we've adopted, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember when no one had a mobile phone and then one or two people had one and then suddenly everyone had one. <laughs> and I think we're reaching that sort of tipping point or that the inflection point on the S-curve with the economics of, of renewables. Uh, and you're seeing this not just in developed economies like the UK and, and in Europe, but in emerging economies across the world. And indeed in emerging economies, that transition might be even swifter because they're not having to phase out as if they're building up their energy supply to, to meet increasing energy demand. In contrast, in the UK, uh, electricity demand has been falling over in recent years. If you're building up your energy supply, then obviously you build your supply with the cheapest form of generation available. It's also interesting to think about the geopolitics of energy moving forward, how they might move from a handful of petro states and a fossil fuel dominated energy system to a perhaps a more distributed on one level system, but also with potential bottlenecks and key geographies that will be the superpowers of energy of tomorrow. Right, I, I completely agree. And one of the things that I think uh, diplomacy around the world hasn't done uh, enough of yet is really consider the impact of the energy transition uh, upon geopolitics. Mm. And it will shift geopolitics. You mentioned the DRC uh, and access to cobalt. There are you know, states which have minerals that will be important to the low carbon economy. Uh, and equally, we will see a reduction in our dependence upon the major hydrocarbon producers like Russia uh, and other parts of the world where hydrocarbons form a large part of the economy. And we'll see increasing energy self-sufficiency uh, amongst the countries around the world. And, and people are beginning to think about this. And you see leaders, inspired leaders around the world, realizing that actually, if they accelerate, particularly in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, if they accelerate their transition to renewables, actually, they'll be dependent on no one. Uh, for their electricity mm. supply and it will aid their country's um, security as well as their country's economy.